so used to Phil or Philip, both of our names are the same. He's going to share a song. I know it's going to bless you, and um, he's just going to share from his heart before he sings. I shared with the early service that uh, at Promise Keepers last weekend, uh, where several of us men went to, uh, just to hear from God, and uh, we did. <laughs> And um, while I was there, I felt a certain uh, sense of security. It's one thing I really came home with, and that was knowing that uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of men all over this country, not only that 40-something thousand that were there in Denton, but uh, just uh, God let me know that all over this country there are thousands of men who are not ashamed of Jesus Christ. And who are standing up for who they believe in and for what they believe. And um, thousands of men who are now taking a stand and reclaiming a lot of things that we may have uh, dropped along the wayside in years past. And uh, just just being renewed in the faith and in uh, getting back to the basics of God's Word and the basics of life. Which are just loving Jesus, serving Jesus, and serving each other in a spirit of love. And uh, just having faith in God Almighty and uh, forgetting a lot of the things, you know, that we've created for ourselves that were not of God and getting back to the basic things of God. And that's Jesus. And uh, that's what this song is about. We've turned the page new day has dawned and we've rearranged what is right and what's wrong somehow we've drifted so far from the truth that we can't get back home and where are the virtues that once gave us light and where are the morals that governed our lives Someday we all will awake and look back Just to find what we've lost And we need to get back to the basics of a life A heart that is pure And a love that is blind A faith that is fervently grounded in Christ The hope that endures for all times These are the basics We need to get back to the basics of life The newest rage is to reason it out and just meditate and you can overcome every doubt well after all man is a god and they say god is no longer alive but i still believe in the old rugged cross oh and i still believe there is hope for the lost and I know the rock of all ages will stand through the changes of time, the changes of time. And we need to get back to the basics of a life, a heart that is pure and a love that is blind a faith that is fervently grounded in christ the hope that endures for all time these are the basics we need to get back to the basics of life and we've let the darkness invade us too long we've got to turn the tide oh and we need the passion that burned long ago to come and open our eyes there's no room for compromise we need to get back 
to the basics of life A heart that is pure And the love that is blind We need to get back to the basics of life A heart that is pure And the love that is blind A faith that is fervently grounded in Christ The hope that endures for all time We need all the basics we need to get back to the basics of life The basics of life A heart that is pure And a love that is blind A faith that is fervently grounded in Christ The hope that endures for all times but These are the basics we need to get back to the basics of life Basics of life These are the basics of life We need the basics of life The basics of life God's people said. Amen. Would you open your copy of the Word of God, please, to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2. Phil, we appreciate that so much. Thank you for sharing your gift with us. I think most of us are aware of the fact that uh, Phil Rayburn is now full-time in evangelism, and next Sunday begins his first meeting as a full-time evangelist out at Washita Baptist Church with Werner as well. And so, brother, we are with you, and we will be with you in spirit and be praying for you and grateful to God for you. We live in a time when no matter what an individual does, it's always somebody else's fault. <laughs> Isn't that right? It doesn't matter what a person does whether it's something small or something very hideous and awful. And sometimes the more hideous and awful it is, the more it is somebody else to blame. You're aware of the uh, trial that went on just recently, the Menendez brothers. They were on trial for the brutal murder of their parents. Whose fault was it? It was their parents' fault. Now that's a horrible and a hideous thing. But that goes all the way through, through our whole society, even down to small things. Do you know whose fault it is if someone steals your car? It's your fault for leaving it unlocked. Isn't that right? <laughs> that's right. There was a big campaign a few years ago. Lock your car. Don't cause a good boy to go wrong. I got a better one for him. Lock your car or some punk will steal it. Right? <laughs> I mean, really, we, we live in a time, I mean, look at Washington. It's always the last twi 12 years that are to blame for all the problems we got now. I mean, it's all the blame game, the blame game, the blame game. But I want to speak to you this morning on the subject of how to win the blame game. Would you like to know how to win the blame game? Well, let's look at the Word of God and see what the Lord says about the blame game. Let's stand together as we read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And let's begin reading in uh, verse 10. The Apostle Paul is writing to that church at Thessalonica in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says, You are witnesses, and so is God how devoutly and uprightly and what? Blamelessly we behave toward you believers, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father 
would his own children, the Apostle Paul was not a biological father, but he was certainly a spiritual father, wasn't he? So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. How can you win the blame game? You win the blame game by living a blameless life. Pastor, can I live a blameless life? How in the world can I live? Can anyone live a blameless life? Friend, if God didn't expect it and give the power to do it, he would not have put it in his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what's happened in our hearts already today. And Lord, as we come to this moment in time and open your word together, Father, I just pray that you'll help us to get a clear word from you today. Father, speak to us each and speak to us all, I pray. Father, if you want to take this whole thing in a different direction than I've planned, you're welcome to do it. This is your time, not my time. And so, Lord, I just surrender to you the best I know how into your hands. And Father, you just guide us as we seek to hear from you now, not to make us smarter, but to make us more like Jesus. And that's our prayer in his name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Would you be seated, please? How to win the blame game. How to live a blameless life. The apostle Paul was able to write to that church that knew him well and say, you're my witnesses. You know that I live before you a blameless life. And not only you are a witness to that, but God himself can witness to the fact that we lived a blameless life before you. And friend, listen, may I just share with you out of my heart, I want to live a blameless life. I do. I want to live a blameless life. And as your pastor, as your pastor, I want that for you. Just as the Apostle Paul wanted it for that church in Thessalonica, I want it for this church in Lampkin too. I want Temple to be a blameless fellowship. Now, if we're going to live a blameless life, first of all, let's get a partial picture anyway of what a blameless life is like. Now, look with me, please. This same chapter, but look back in verse 3, and let's get a picture of the blameless life. He says here, for our exhortation, our preaching, our teaching, our encouragement does not come, first of all, from error and then our impurity are by way of deceit. A picture of the blameless life. First of all, he said, it is not from error. A blameless life is a truthful, a truthful life. Dear friends, we live in a nation that is suffering a dearth of truth. Who do you believe anymore? Is anybody telling the truth anymore? Who can you trust anymore? Friend, listen, a child of God, a person that lives a blameless life, that means you are living a truthful life. The Apostle Paul said, that's the kind of life that I live before you there in Thessalonica. I was honest. I did not bring error. I brought truth when I spoke to you, what I lived out before you. It was truth. It was truth. It was truth without mixture of error. Well, my dear friends, I have found out in our society, in our culture, truth is just very much lacking today. As you know, I write to our senators. I write to our congressmen. I write to all those people. Give me the address. I'll write to them. I mean, and then I put the answers, the responses, I should say, on the bulletin board so you can see how our representatives respond to questions about things that should concern us as Christians and as citizens. Have you noticed in those letters, have you noticed this? They have, they have completely mastered the skill of being able to write to you and even disagree with you without making you angry about it. They have mastered the skill of going all around the subject and you read the letter and you say, I still don't know where this cat is on this thing. You know, have you noticed that? I mean, that's right. You cannot depend on a politician anymore, it seems, to tell the truth. Oh, they'll tell you what you want to hear, but then they'll turn around and they'll do exactly the opposite. 
That's why people go in to see certain one of our high ranking, uh, our high rank, most highly ranked politicians in our state and even in our nation. And preachers will go in and meet with them. They'll come out and say, oh, he's a wonderful man. He loves God. Then he'll turn around and, and do some, some awful, awful thing that hurts the family and causes deaths to, to babies unborn. My goodness, how do they do that? It's because there's no truth. A person that's living a blameless life, listen, first of all, that life is a life that is a truthful life. That's not just politicians. We, we're exposed to that on every level of society. And you know people that are not truthful that you deal with every day. There was a, a certain high society lady, put it in Louisiana terminology, a highfalutin woman, that decided she was going to do a study of her genealogy. How many of you ever done that? Just look back and see. Yeah. Well, she began to study her genealogy, and she's going to write it all down in a book. But you know what she found out? She found out that her grandfather had been convicted as a murderer and electrocuted in the, in the electric chair in Sing Sing Prison. That didn't stop her, though. Listen, she still wrote glowingly about her grandfather in her genealogy book. Here's what she wrote. One of my grandfathers occupied the chair of applied electricity. <laughs> and one of them, I can only get through this thing. At one of America's best known institutions. He was very much attached to his position and literally died in the harness there. <laughs> Now, you know people like that. I mean, they, even when they tell the truth, there's a shade of error in it. But the Apostle Paul says, you are my witness, and God is my witness that what I brought to you and what I live before you was a truthful life. Not only that, look at the next thing he says. It was, does not come from error or impurity. Listen, the, the blameless life is a life of moral cleanness, a morally clean life. It is still possible today to live a morally clean life. You say, well, pastor, you don't understand. You're old. <laughs> <laughs> You're old and you don't understand what it is. It's, 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 it's these movies, it's these videos, it's uh, MTV, it's the magazine. My eyes, I just don't have control over my eyes. And I, I look at these things, I know they're not right, I shouldn't look at them, but it's my eyes, Pastor. Really? Or you say, well, Pastor, it's, it's my ears. Yeah, it's my ears. Down there on the job, they tell those smutty stories, and some of them are so funny, I just can't help but enter in. Listen to those dirty jokes. Oh, pastor, it's my ears, and my ears are the problem. That's what it is. He said, well, pastor, uh, I, I know it's not right to uh, tell things that, about people. I know it's not right to gossip. But, you know, I'm like that person that said, I don't repeat gossip, so listen close the first time. But it's my tongue, Pastor. It's my tongue. It's all my tongue's fault. Well, friend, let's just think about that for a minute. If we, if we were to take out your tongue and lay it on a table somewhere, now some people, they keep flopping for a while before it finally settles down. But you know what? You could listen to that tongue and listen to it, and it would never say a word of gossip, would it? Like one gossip came to her pastor and during the invitation, she said, Pastor, I know I'm a gossip. I know I am. I'm convicted in my heart about my gossip. And I'm going to stop gossiping. And this morning, I'm coming during the invitation. And I just want to lay my tongue on the altar before God. The pastor said, well, we'll lay it on the altar, but we might have to fold it a few times before it'll fit. <laughs> Friend, listen, that is so bogus. It's not your eyes that cause you to sin. You see, your eyes don't see that wicked thing. You look at that wicked thing through your eyes. That's right. Your ears don't hear that dirty story. You hear that dirty story through your ears. 
Your tongue doesn't speak that gossip. You speak that gossip with your tongue. Whatever else it may mean to be spirit-filled, it means to be in control. Whatever else it may mean, it means that. That's part of the fruit of the Spirit is self control. So don't tell me it's your eyes that make you, even if I am old, listen, there's still some fire in the oven. Listen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's not your eyes, it's not your ears, it's not your tongue that makes you sin. You sin with those instruments. They don't sin. It's you that are sinning. My friend, listen, the Apostle Paul said, the life that's a blameless life is a life that is morally clean. It's a morally clean life. He says also, it does not come from by way of deceit. By way of deceit. That word for deceit there literally means the baiting of a hook. In other words, what Paul was saying is that when I exhorted, when I preached to you, I didn't fashion the message to fit the congregation so as to look out there and see someone and say, ah, I want that person to be in my church. So I'm going to bait my hook to say just the right thing so I won't offend them and I'll see what I can get out of them. Well, a lot of preachers preach that way today. He's not that kind of preacher. He said, I, I, I didn't come and I didn't exhort you by deceit, I didn't say, as I looked out on the congregation, I'd see a man or a woman and say, I wonder what I can get out of that person. The Apostle Paul was more likely to look and see someone and say, I wonder what I can give that person. A few weeks ago, I preached on that uh, passage or on the introductory message to Mark, and I, I showed you there in Mark 10, 45, where the Lord said, "If you, the one that is the servant of all will be... Is, is the leader. That's how you determine who the leader is in the, in the uh, kingdom of God. It's not being served. He said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Didn't he say that? And so the next day, I thought to myself, I am going to emphasize that. I'm going to make a, an emphasis of that today. I'm going to really make an emphasis of that. And so everybody that I came in contact with, whether it's on the telephone or in person, I worked in the conversation somehow. I said, what can I do for you today? <laughs> you know what? People are not used to hearing that. They're not. I, I called over the Nelba office, our Northeast Louisiana Baptist office, to try to see if there's a, a, a staff position open that I could recommend the person to. And before I hung up, I said, Jerry, he told me all he could tell me. I said, Jerry, what can I do for you today? And there was a, there was a pause. <laughs> he doesn't, I, don't, I wonder if he's ever had anybody say that to him or not. You know what? That's what Jesus said we ought to be about. Not what can I get out of somebody. What can I give to somebody? Paul was that kind of person because he was like Jesus. Amen? We've got a picture here, a little composite picture of what a blameless life is like. But I want you to see something else about this matter of a blameless life. I want to see you to see the power of a blameless life. What motivates a person to want to live a, a blameless life? Well, here are a few things. and I, I'm switching over to the Living Bible, but I'm in the same place that you are and I want to read from the Living Bible because it makes it so clear. And in verse 11 there of chapter 2 in 1 Thessalonians, it says this, We talk to you as a father to his own children. Don't you remember? Pleading with you, encouraging you, and even demanding, now get this, that your daily lives should not embarrass God but bring a joy to Him who invited you into His kingdom to share His glory. Friend, listen, if you are born again by the grace of God today, if you're saved, if you are saved, if you're a member of God's kingdom and God's family, you are there by invitation. Do you know that? It wasn't your idea. It was God's idea. We are part of His kingdom and part of His family because God initiated it. That's right. And what does it show when we live a life that embarrasses God? The church has really been embarrassed the last few years about 
certain people that have fallen. You know what I'm talking about. Well, I tell you, when I hung that newspaper article, those three sheets of paper out there on the on the uh, bulletin board the other day, uh, it was such a happy thing because of the promise keepers. But right there in that same piece of newspaper, I didn't know where to cut it out or just leave it up there. There's an article about my mentor, the fellow that got me really started in the ministry, and how he has fallen, and how he tried to explain it all to his church that particular Sunday. Oh, I tell you, we've, we've, the church has been embarrassed lately. But friend, listen, that's not what we need to concentrate on. We need not to concentrate on how somebody big, some big shot somewhere, some big preacher somewhere embarrassed the church. We need to concentrate on what have I done this last week that embarrassed God? Amen. You see, God knew what those fellows were up to and He is the one that exposed it. Judgment begins where? At the house of God, doesn't it? God was the one that let all that come out. He already knew about it. But wait a minute, there's stuff in your life and in my life that doesn't make the headlines, but it still causes heartache to God the Father. Oh, why? Why do we live when we're there by invitation? We're just we're Christians because God reached out and He touched a dirty, filthy object like us with the blood of Jesus and cleansed us. Why would we want to live a life that embarrasses God? We ought to live a life that brings joy to Him. But not only that, also not only do we need to be careful about living a daily life that embarrasses God, but as I turn over to the next book, 2 Thessalonians, here's another verse in verse 12 of chapter 1. Then everyone will be praising the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get this. Because of the results they see in you. You see, we not only should live a, a blameless life to, in order not to bring embarrassment to God, but we ought to live a blameless life in order to bring glory to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Are you getting what I'm saying today? We ought to live a blameless life for God's sake for, for, so we don't embarrass God and so that our lives, as people see the result, the change of our lives, they give glory to Jesus for the way that we are. Folk, listen, there are people that won't become a Christian because they know a Christian. Say, so, buddy, I don't know what you've got, but I don't want any part of it. i got enough problems without being a hypocrite too. Right? There are people, they, they, they won't darken the door of the church because they know the Christians aren't on the job. So I'm not going to that church. I know those people over there too well. Boy, it's quiet in here today. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Listen, there ought to be a power to live the, the blameless life. There ought to be a motive to live it because we don't want to bring embarrassment and shame to God. No, we want to bring glory to Jesus. I want you to see something else. When you look back into the Old Testament with me for just a moment, let's see about the purpose for a blameless life. And in Proverbs chapter 3, two verses I want us to look at there in Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 1, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. And then look at verse 4. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. He says, keep my commandments. If you keep my commandments then, then you will find favor. And that word for favor is the Old Testament word for grace. It's the same word that's used where it says over in the book of Genesis that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You say, now wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought I, I, thought I experienced God's grace already when I got saved. You did. You're saved by grace through faith. That's how, you, if you're saved, you're saved by grace. And grace is God's unmerited favor. And now you're saying to me, preacher, that I need to keep the commandments in order to have the grace of God? No, not to be saved. But the Bible also says we're to grow in what? In grace. 
How do you grow in grace? You grow in grace as you live for God, as you live the, the blameless life, what we're talking about. He says, as you live this blameless life, then you'll begin to experience the, the growth in grace with God. See, we, I say we, we Baptists, those of us in the room that are Baptists, listen, you know, we uh, take this, this eternal security thing and we make something out of it the Bible does not. We say, once saved, always saved. Well, when I was five years old, I went down the aisle and I shook hands with that old starchy preacher. And I got put under the, all the way under the water. Not like those Methodists. I mean, I went all the way under. Glub, glub, glub. <laughs> and now I can just do what I want to because I know I'm saved. Wrong. Wrong. If you've got the idea that once saved, always saved, mean that you can walk down an aisle and shake a preacher's hand, starchy or not, and be baptized, put all the way under the water, not sprinkled, but I mean splash real deep down in the water, and then you go live for the devil the rest of your life and die to go to heaven, you're lost. You're lost, buddy. I mean it. I say that from from my heart of concern, but if that's the way you think about once saved, always saved, you're a lost person. You need to get saved. You need to get born again, man. By the way, you know what happens to a saved person when they don't walk with God? Something people don't know about anymore. They get spanked. They say, oh, don't spank the children. Don't spank the children. Look at that preacher up there. He got spanked. Look how it warped his personality. <laughs> It warped more than my personality. I, <laughs> I didn't get spanked, man. I got whoopings. I mean, I got whooping. And now I got the, my mother say, you wait till your daddy gets home. How many have ever heard that one? Boy, that's serious. That is serious. But if you're a child of God, the Bible says he will, chast he will correct you. Or, this is, I'm putting it just blunt so you'll get it, or he'll kill you. 1 John 5, sin unto death. That's right. If he can't straighten you up, he'll take you home. That's right. You've had your kids out saying, you don't straighten up, I'm going to take you home. That's what God has to do with some of his kids. Man, I mean, read 1 Corinthians. He was taking them out over there because they were sloppy in the way they did the Lord's Supper. That's right. That's right. My goodness, man, come on. If, you're, if you are a member of a church... Any denomination, I don't care what denomination, and you can live like the devil, and God never corrects you or he doesn't kill you, you're not saved. Now, I'm trying to be plain about it today. Do you mind if I just get plain about it today? <laughs> That's right, you're not saved. If God isn't working on your case, you're not saved because he corrects his children. He doesn't let them run wild. <laughs> That's right. You ever seen a kid just go spastic in the store? Blah, 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 you know, just run up down the aisles? No, he said, Boy, if that's my kid. <laughs> right? Right. Well, what do you think about God? He said, That's my child, and you better straighten up. I'm going to take you home. Friend, that's just the way it is. I'm just sorry. That's the way it is. Well, what's the purpose then of, of serving God? It's so that God might use us that might, he might use us. People say, well, I know that God would rather use a clean vessel, but he'll use me anyway. Wrong. You might find yourself a place of service somewhere and get up and, and do whatever you do, but that doesn't mean God is really using you. That doesn't mean it's going to go, that, means not, that doesn't mean it's going to have a spiritual impact. Look here. I, I started to do this, but Maybe I can just describe it to you and maybe it'll have the same effect without, without actually doing it. Let's say that I held a glass of water in both hands as I stood here before you. And, and one, of, one of them, I said, now this glass of water here, they're both crystal clear. This glass of water here is from the water store down on Desert. I mean, it's not only city water, it's been through that stuff. It's been through all that stuff at the, at the water store. I mean, there's no fluoride in it. There's no chlorine in it. This is pure, pure water. Now, this glass of water is the same water, but before this service, I had one of the deacons take the lid off of the septic tank out back. And I just got one little drop 
of water out of that septic tank and I put it in this glass here. Now, which one do you want? Well, you can't, they look the same. They look exactly the same. They smell the same. Now, which one do you want? <laughs> what do you think? Don't you think God's got as much sense as you do? I couldn't get you to drink that. I could, you wouldn't drink that glass with that septic tank water in for $100. Well, some of you might, but I mean, not, not many of you would. You'd, re, you'd hesitate anyway, wouldn't you? <laughs> you see what I'm driving at, don't you? Now, if, God, if you've got that much sense, God knows what it means to use a clean vessel. And you say, well, that's just a little habit I've got. Done nobody's business but my own. Friend, listen, if you want to be used by God, you ought, by the grace of God and by His Spirit, seek to live a blameless life. Have I achieved it? No. Am I trying for it? Yes. And I hope that you are too. You see, he says here that we'll gain favor and good reputation with God and who else? With man. He said uh, a minute ago, preacher, that we ought to not try to please people in the way we speak, pre preaching things. That's not what it's talking about here. It's talking about having an open door. Remember the guy a while ago that said, I don't want anything to do with Christians? I've seen too many of them. You see, when we live a blameless life before people, we've got an open door to speak to them about the things of God, don't we? Don't we? So many people, there's a shut door because of this thing of people living a blame-filled life before them. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's just part of the, the way things are. And my friend, I want to tell you this. When you live, seek to live a blameless life, there's, there's three responses that you can count on from people. There's three responses. One, from lost people. The, res, the response you get from lost people will be either, the, it will either be they'll respect you. They'll say, I don't believe what you do, but you believe it and it affects your life. You're, you're a a uh, person that's trying to live a good life, and I respect you for that, or they'll reject you. They just won't have anything to do with you. Those that are seekers after God, they will speak well of you. They will fellowship with you. They will want to know how you are progressing and what it is that's helping you as you progress. What books are you reading? What, what are you doing? How, how are you doing this and doing that? Uh, do you have a Bible study going on at your house? Or, you know, they'll want to spend time with you because the seeker after God is attracted to the person who's trying to live a blameless life. Amen. But there's a third response, and watch out. The carnal Christian, the backslider. You know what kind of response you'll get from them when you begin to live the blameless life? They will despise you. They will despise you. They don't like you. Why? You're trying to live for God, and they're not. That's why. And your light exposes their darkness. Amen. Someone has said that, that when your life is like lightning, your words will be like thunder. What does that mean? That means that when your life has the brilliance of lightning, then your words will be heard. But see, that, that carnal Christian, they don't want to hear your words. And the lighter your life is, the more it exposes their darkness, and they don't want to be around you. They'll talk bad about you. Right? Man come to his pastor, his pastor, he said, he said, my wife, I, I don't know what's happened to her. He said, she used to be the sweetest thing. I mean, she was sweet. Sweet lady. But she's just not sweet anymore. Matter of fact, she's not only not sweet, she's cranky. Well, she is hard to live with. Pastor, I'll just be honest with you. She's, she's mean as a junkyard dog. I mean, she is bad to be around. Pastor, you wouldn't believe it. She criticizes everything. She criticizes me, the children, the neighbors, the church. Well, Pastor, I hate to tell you, she even criticizes your sermons. <laughs> Surely you just. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, when a when I, a carnal Christian, when you keep slapping them with the Word of God over and over and over again, you know what's going to happen? They're either going to get right, 
are they going to be angry, angry, angry with you? Yes. That's right. That's right. You see, conviction without repentance always leads to anger. That's right. You find somebody, you run across somebody that's constantly grumbling and griping. I mean, they don't like anything. They don't like the paint on the wall. They don't like the carpet. They don't like the flowers. They don't like the Sunday school. They don't like the teacher. They don't like the location. They don't like anything. Most of the time, that person's under conviction and won't get right with God. I'm trying to be plain today. Is this plain enough? That's right. Well, how can we live a blameless life? What does it mean to live a blameless life? What is the product? What is the, what is the, 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 uh, the, the end of a blameless life? What, when you live a blameless life, what is it like? And I'm going to turn over to Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to show you in Philippians chapter 3. What does it profit a person to live? A blameless life. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. He says, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, friend, listen. Prize, the, the, the product of a, of a blameless life, first of all, is freedom. Freedom from the past. The Apostle Paul said, I've forgotten what's behind. It's all under the blood of Jesus, man. Now, if anybody, if the Apostle Paul, I mean, think about Paul as Saul of Tarsus. Hey, man, he was in on stoning Stephen. A deacon. Anybody that stones a deacon is in deep trouble, right? <laughs> right. You deacons, you amen. I get some amens on that one. <laughs> and he he persecuted the church. If anybody ought to have the mother of all guilt trips, it ought to be Paul, right? But you know what he says? He said, I'm living a blameless life now. That's all under the blood. That's under the blood, man. That's, that's all back there. I've forgotten all that. And what am I doing now? Not only does it give you freedom from the past, it gives you hope. Hope for the future. He said, I'm, I hadn't got it yet, but man, I'm reaching out for it. I'm straining for it. I want it. I'm trying to find it. That upward call. He's not just talking about heaven. He's talking about the blameless life. You could have a little bit of heaven right here by living that blameless life. He said, that's what I'm all about. I'm all about reaching out to, to do what God wants me to do. I want to be that blameless person that God wants me to be. And I'm reaching for it. Folk, I want to be that kind of person too. And I want that for you. I want us all to be like Paul and forget those things that are behind. It's under the blood. Reach out for what's out there for us. So why? I, I want to live that kind of life too, preacher, but I, why can't I do it? Well, some people are not able to live the blameless life simply because they've never been saved. They're on a church roll somewhere, but they've never ever really experienced the grace of God. Never have. You need to be saved, friend. You need to receive Jesus. You need to let God accept you. <laughs> People say, oh, I accepted Christ, friend. Listen, you got, you got the thing all turned around. He accepted you. But you need to receive Him as Lord. So some people are not living the blameless life because they've really never been saved. And then there are people that have been saved that aren't living the blameless life because they're trying to do it all in the flesh. And God didn't come, Jesus didn't come to reform your flesh. He came to crucify your flesh. Do you realize that?